announcements this morning. Uh, Denny told me there is no Bible study tonight. It is next Sunday night, I believe he said. So keep that in mind. Um, men's basketball still continues Saturday, 9 to noon. Uh, women's Christmas brunch. There's a sign-up sheet out there. It's uh, this coming Saturday, 10 a.m. at Fay Rays. So please sign up if you plan to attend today. Uh, Christmas cards. People still send those, I believe. So if you want to check, we've got a couple filing cabinets out there. If you want to check your name for uh, cards, you can take home. Uh, if you do get them in the mail, uh, cut off the postage stamp. Um, they trim them and send them to Florida where they're used for missionary projects. So remember that if you get them through the mail still. Uh, December 22nd, Kenny Lambert's next um, next outing um, down on the boulevard. Um, there will also be pots of chili that we need on the same day, December 22nd, after the giveaway, the gift giveaway. It'll be here. So we do need a lot of chili for that. We had like 12 pots last time, but uh, we're expecting more people. So if you're good at making chili, or not good at making chili, <laughs> just don't put your name on it so we don't know who it is. So, but we had a good, we had over 100 people show up last time, so that was a that was an answer to prayer. So, and we also need cookies. Handing out cookies and hot chocolate on Sunday at 1, Sunday the 22nd. So if you'd like to provide cookies, please have them here at the church on Saturday, December 21st. That's when I go to back. Or drop them off here Friday in the morning. So, uh, I believe there's our daily breads out there if you use that for a devotion. Um, there are are out there if you want to take one. Uh, I believe that's all that I have. Anybody have anything else? Nothing? Yes, Chris. So we got our uh, every other week men's Bible study on Sunday night. It's supposed to be tonight, but it has moved to next week. Okay. So, all right. If you want to stand, we'll continue. Continue to worship.
turn that on. Good morning. Good morning. Patty, I love that song. Mohaw Rose Blooming. Today's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 4, verses 13 through 22. It's on page 94 of your pew book in the New Testament section. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and stood, understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing by them, they had nothing to reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that the noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it but so that it would not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer in this man's name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it is right in the sight of God, give, give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And when they threatened them further, they let them go, finding on no basis on which to punish them on the account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was was 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Our Father and our God, we are truly thankful and praise and honor you because you are the great physician. You are the healer. You healed us through your stripes on your back and the blood that was spilled out for us, Father. We just thank you for that. We just ask that you would uh, forgive us of our sins and hear our prayer. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, John. Appreciate you reading the scripture. You ruined my pop quiz. I was going to ask you all, how many of you knew that song that Patty played? Just, okay, a few. That is an incredible song. It's a beautiful song. Um, the the Christians have a rich tradition of music. We've had oh twenty centuries to accumulate good, good, good songs, and some of them are spanning centuries. I actually I don't know how old. Do you know how old that song is, Patty? Okay. Well, there are some. What's that? Lo, how a rose air blooming. Yeah, uh, beautiful song. There's a, I won't, that's a whole other rabbit trail I'll resist going down, uh, but uh, just beautiful, beautiful songs. The other one that you play this morning is, Oh Lord, You're Beautiful. And um, I've, I've done some, some thinking about that, and, and pardon the little digressions here, but you know, you've, you've never seen God, and yet we're singing, Oh Lord, You're Beautiful. And it's true, Right? Uh, which then raises the question, which is how my mind works, what are you saying is beautiful if you've never seen, uh, seen the Lord? And yet there's something in our soul that says, yeah, beauty is symmetry and correct proportion. When things are in right alignment, it gives us pleasure. Because it's like, when you look at the architecture of a building, you ever notice how these wooden beams, they all meet right up in the center, and then there's like a circle, a uh, little bit of a circle up there? That, that's symmetry. Everything's coordinated. And it's the same thing with God, is that in his person, all of his attributes, love 
and justice, righteousness, compassion, all of these things meet and they're properly aligned. So it's perfect balance. And he's the only person in the universe that we can truly say is beautiful. Um, and yet one day we'll actually get to see God uh, face to face. But um, yeah, just a little, little digression. I love music. Um, I, I can't play any instruments, but uh, music directs our affections towards God. I think it's uh, Bach who said it's an agreeable harmony to the glory of God. Uh, but anyway, all of that... Um, uh, I hope you gained a few pounds this past week. It would be appropriate. Now you got to work them off and then get ready for the next big push uh, for Christmas and New Year's, uh, New Year's Eve and day and, and all of that. And it's, it's appropriate to celebrate. Um, but anyway, we read a, the scripture that was read in our hearing this morning is from Acts chapter 4. I want to preach to you this morning on this subject, speaking by the Spirit speaking by the Spirit. And let me just explain a little bit kind of where we're headed on this. I've been kind of, I've been hitting up themes and subjects that have to do with how to live out our faith today. Not in 1950, not in 1900, today. And there are certain things that have shifted in our culture that require kind of a different a different take. It's a new ball game. It's, in, a, in a sense, it's the same ball game, just new, new expressions. But speaking by the Spirit, we've been dealing with subjects like speaking boldly, speaking the gospel boldly. We've addressed a passage from First Peter, which has to do with sanctifying Christ in our hearts, setting Him aside, and our loyalties to Jesus are up here. Our loyalties to political parties are down here. Negligible. Okay? Uh, these things matter. And so today I want to speak on speaking by the Spirit. Okay, what do we mean by that? Uh, well, very briefly, speaking by means of the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Okay? Now, if you have been in this movement or denomination. I think the Kingsway has officially kind of moved out of the Christian Missionary Alliance. And um, I've spent years in the Christian Missionary Alliance, but one of the primary emphases in that movement has been the Holy Spirit. And, and rightly so. Um, it's, it's an emphasis in, in that movement. And uh, one of the, the things that they're really dialed in on, the passage that talks about being filled with the Spirit, is Ephesians 5.18. And that explains a little bit about, Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I've preached on that. If I preach on it once, I preach on it hundreds of times. I've heard messages on it, just hundreds of messages on um, being filled with the Spirit. And the idea is biblical. It's right. But how do you know? <laughs> If you're filled by the Spirit, what are the evidences of that? And so I, my goal this morning, really, are very simple goals. Number one is to communicate and to prove to you from the Scriptures that one of the primary evidences that you are filled by the Holy Spirit is your speech. The things that you say will prove give evidence to the fact that this Holy Spirit is in fact filling you. That's really like, the, that's the main thing I want to kind of get across. Now, you could say, well, isn't that kind of a, 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 a cerebral point? Oh, now I agree or I see that being filled with the Spirit proves itself primarily, or at least one of the primary ways, in what I'm saying. Well, we won't stop there. Then I want to dive into what actually Holy Spirit inspired speech kind of break that down a little bit and then finally I want to give you an opportunity to respond because it's not enough at least in my mind I'm not okay understanding something up here if it's good I want it and so I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond and to actually uh, indicate to the Holy Spirit that you would like to have more of, of him we'll have a like a, like a, a mini uh, altar call um, but that's the three things. One, that one of the primary manifestations of being filled with the Spirit is your speech. And number two, there will be specifics on what that speech actually looks like. And then number three, give you an opportunity to 
actually respond to that. Okay, so we looked in the book of Acts. We read, it was in the book of Acts chapter 4 about Peter's the preaching and some of the uh, things that he, he and John were saying and the response of the, the Jewish leaders to that. But I want to back up a little bit. And if you want to know what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you can search that phrase, pop in Holy Spirit, BibleGateway.com. Anyone know, anyone know that website? Okay, I'm there all the time. BibleGateway.com, pop in Holy Spirit, search, go. And then limit, look at the books in the New Testament and look at where the primary, look at which books have the phrase the most, or you can even say Spirit, capital S. So, I'm going to help you out a little bit here, okay? If you search Spirit, capital S, and limit it to the Gospels, Matthew, 20 occurrences. Mark, 25. Luke, 37. John, 20. Acts, 70. Now, say, well, why does that matter? Well, the same guy who wrote Luke is the same guy who wrote Acts. It's like a two-volume set. In Luke's world, the Holy Spirit is a primary, listen, primary theological motif, a theme. And so it's not surprising that in Luke's gospel we have so much material on what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit, okay? So that's why we went to Acts 4. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a lightning round. We're going to start in Ephesians 5. We're going to look at that verse about be filled with the Spirit. And then I want to dive back and look at Luke and Acts and just dial in real quickly on some occurrences of the idea of being filled with the Spirit and what, 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 that, what actually happens. Okay, first scripture, Ephesians chapter 5. Okay, now... Just a quick show of hands. How many of you are familiar with this verse? Okay, some of you didn't raise your hand. You are familiar. You're going you're gonna to recognize it. Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Command. Okay, okay. He's just rattling off a bunch of commands. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. What does it look like to be filled with the Spirit? Well, the next couple verses actually kind of go into that look at this verse 19 addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody to the lord with all your heart that's an evidence of being filled with the spirit say so what do we just go to one another in the grocery store and start singing a song uh well we made melodies this morning we were singing you're singing to god you're also really kind of singing to yourself and to one another this is, this is an evidence of being filled with the Spirit. Someone who doesn't possess the Holy Spirit doesn't like singing praise songs. All right? Verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So be filled with the Spirit, singing songs, and giving thanks. Speech! Not just any old speech. We believe in freedom of speech here in America, right? Yeah, this is Holy Spirit-inspired speech. Now, traditionally and rightly so, if you think of being filled with the Spirit, it's more than just speaking the content of your speech, being surrendered to God. But really the idea is that you are full of God. Someone who's operating in the flesh, <laughs> okay, not a lot of thanksgiving and not a lot of praise. In fact, criticism, insults, backstabbing, jealous talk, all of that is flesh. The opposite of the Spirit. And you put a person who's operating in the flesh in proximity to a person who's operating in the Spirit, you're going to have war. They're going to have problems getting along because one person is like overflowing with praise to God and thanksgiving and the other person is wanting to tear that stuff down. Speech. Okay, that's Ephesians 5.18. So a proof that you're filled with the Spirit, at least one primary proof is that there's praise to God, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and also giving thanks to God. 
Be filled with the Spirit. It's not just theoretical. It actually manifests in real time in this way. So that's Ephesians 5.18. Now the reason I went there is because that's Paul referencing being filled with the Spirit. He only makes like one reference. And yet, like, in my experience, most of the messages on being filled with the Spirit come from that one verse. And that's a good verse. There's a ton of other material in Luke and Acts. So now I want to do the lightning round, okay? And you can just kind of hang on, you can just kind of ride the wave here, but I'm going to go first to Luke. And again, Luke wrote Luke, and Luke wrote the book of Acts. And we'll get to Acts 13, which is a scripture that was read by John earlier. So, Gospel of Luke. Chapter 1, verses 41 and 42. This is the account of Mary visiting Elizabeth. Verse 41. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, so Mary comes and he greets, Mary, Mary greets, she greets Elizabeth. The baby, that is John, leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. How do we know? She exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And she goes on talking. So, I would describe it maybe this way. Have you ever you ever been almost overcome with joy in the Lord? Like it just falls on you and you're giving praise and thanks maybe in, the, in your car while you're driving or you're trying to maintain some level of control because you're at work and the key will go. If you really go crazy, everyone's going to look at you like, what are you doing? But it's an overflow, just an outburst of praise and thanksgiving. And this is what happened to Elizabeth. She filled with the Spirit. I'm going to use the term belch. She belches out praise. That's just one. Same chapter, verse 67. Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, had been mute for some time. The muteness is now gone. Verse 67, and his father, that is John the Baptist's father, his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied saying, here it comes, a big old song that Zechariah, I'm going to use this word again, belches out of just praise and thanksgiving. He's filled with the Spirit. You can describe it this way, just like we said, the flesh and the Spirit are at war with one another. You've heard of someone being demon-possessed? Yes, that person has given over part of their soul or their life and behavior, their mind to the enemy, and the enemy swoops in and begins to take over the, the operating system with the assent of the, the person who you... The corollary of that is true, too, that to be possessed by the Holy Spirit is to willingly voluntarily surrender oneself to God and allow the Spirit to gush through. And again, one of the primary proofs of that is God-honoring, God-glorifying speech. Moving on. Luke 2, 27. Listen to this. Simeon. Actually, I'm going to pick it up in verse 25. There was, a, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It doesn't say he was filled with the Holy Spirit, just the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, away we go. Again, just a, a bubbling phrase of praise and thanksgiving to God. And I'm going to start moving a little faster. If I don't move fast, I'm going to we'll be here all morning just going through these scriptures. Are you starting to get the picture though? 
Okay, Luke chapter 10, verse 21. The Holy Spirit and speech, and we could also add the word rejoicing and joy are kind of locked in. In the same hour he, that is Jesus, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, and he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven, and he goes on for, it's a, it's a thanksgiving uh, praise. Now, I'm going to skip to Acts. Again, Luke wrote Luke, Luke wrote Acts. Here's a common theme. The Holy Spirit is up here in Luke's theology. Chapter 1, verse 8. Again, we've heard these scriptures. This is not new scripture. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus says to the disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses a witness is someone who talks bears witness who tells so when the holy spirit comes upon you something's going to happen you're going to get some power and then you're going to start talking not talking about the election necessarily you're going to start talking about me Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Filled with the Holy Spirit, tongues. Speech. The Holy Spirit is empowering them to speak in tongues. That's 2 4. 2 18. Peter's preaching. It says, In the last days, 18, even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. You mean like. Isaiah and Jeremiah. Not at that level of authority. In fact, now is not the time, but the New Testament prophesying is often just spontaneous, God-inspired speech that is prompted and empowered by the Holy Spirit that cuts through and addresses issues. In fact, I mean, you could, in one sense, some of the songs that we sing might almost classify as prophecy. So that's what's going to happen. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh, and then they're going to... The, the male, male and female servants? These are uh, common people, okay? These are not professionals. They're just ordinary people. And that's what's so amazing, is that when the Holy Spirit comes upon these people, these just ordinary people, they're going to just start speaking and prophesying. Fill with the Spirit. Acts 4, 8. We were just in Acts 4 when John read. Now just hang, we're going we're gonna to go through a few more scriptures. So just hang on, I'm trying to, trying to pound in this one idea. Holy Spirit filling speech. Acts 4, 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. This is a blue-collar Peter, who didn't go to school taking on the court system in Jerusalem, filled with the Spirit, and he just begins to lay into them. Again, he's not a professional. But he's filled with the Spirit, and then he begins, begins to preach. 4 8. 1. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. One more. 
This is Stephen. And he is under duress. His martyrdom is just, it's upon him. Chapter 6, verse 10. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit, that's capital S, with which he was speaking. So here again, there's a common guy, just an ordinary dude, speaking to the authorities and the rulers, which can be pretty intimidating. That can be intimidating. You, you talk to your boss, and you're going you're gonna to throw down on your boss. It's like, oh boy. Um, it can be pretty intimidating, but he's just, he's filled with the spirit, and he confounds the rulers of the age. Now, okay, we're done. I'm not going to go through any more references, but I want to just summarize real quick. You don't get anything this whole morning. <laughs> get this. To be filled with the Spirit necessarily results in bold, God-inspired, God-glorifying speech. It's, it's a necessary thing. It just happens. It's a result of the Holy Spirit. It's not the only. There are other proofs of the Holy Spirit. Filling a man, filling a woman. But this is the primary one. It's just speech. Now, I want to I just stop here a second. You may be thinking, and this is how I think a lot. Man, those apostles, like they're up here. There's like Jesus, and then there's the 12. And then there's like me. You need to understand the scripture that we read, Acts 4.13. Luke says these are ordinary men that were confounding the rulers of the age, the, the, the authorities. Say, well, in my mind, the apostles are up here. But in that day, in that context, they were not uh, superstars. In fact, Peter had betrayed Jesus. It made a mess of, of his faith, screwed up. These are fishermen. So we've got them up here, but in their day and in their time, they weren't up here. They were just figuring it out, obeying Jesus, and then going for it. They, had, they didn't have a college education. They, they knew how to build houses. They knew how to fish. They knew how to fix cars and uh, maybe do some electrical work. But like, don't put them in front of people to give big speeches because that's not, that's not who they are. They just, they're just ordinary guys. Not much different from you and I, okay? Got to get over this hurdle of like, oh, the superstars, they are the ones who give the speeches, who really talk. But like me, someone might say, I, I'm just a, I'm a, I'm a widow. Like I, I mean, I, I don't cast vision for the multitudes. I don't uh, uh, speak in front of large groups of people. Uh, I, I don't... Uh, you may say, I'm, I'm retired. I'm a, a, you got the wrong guy here. <laughs> You're looking for someone up here. I, I, that's not me. Uh, you, you, you should know I've made a wreck out of my life. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have bounced off of people. I've committed uh, a lot of mistakes that we won't talk about at this time. Um, you want to keep going? How long should we go? <laughs> How many things can you say are not right with you because uh, there, there's mistakes that you've made? No different from these people we've just read about. These are common, ordinary people. And the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and they just start like... One of the issues, again, uh, one of the issues is, is that you make it about you. That's one of the big stumbling blocks. You need to get out of the way so that the Holy Spirit can come in you and start to move and release you and turn you into something that He wants so that you begin to speak and be free, and proclaim bold gospel speech. Again, bold is not necessarily yelling in a crowded restaurant, Every, everyone <laughs> repent of your sins at this very moment. It's kind of saying what's needed for the moment, inspired by God. Now, I'll tell you a little story about me, okay? Um, you wouldn't recognize me when I was in middle school and high school. I, guilt and shame had me like I was I was gone like I couldn't speak I mean one person at a time in a private setting and that's about it I'd go through entire classes and not say a single word 
if the teacher would call on me and kind of pin me a little bit, you know, I got to ask a question about the literature we just read, I, I'd say as few words as possible and then be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe, I, I don't know, uh, uh, couldn't. But you know what God does is little by little, you keep saying yes to him and then his spirit gains a little more control, a little more control. It was about in my, my 20s, that the Lord began to give me my speech. The person I'd become, if, if, if my soul was a room this big, I was occupying a one inch by one inch square in a corner somewhere. And um, I mean, the enemy probably was having a field day that, that all of my person, everything about me was just squirreled away in this corner. But little by little, God began to set me free. And when the Holy Spirit begins to fill you up, what you find is you get your mind. <laughs> you have access to your mind. If you know your mind, then you begin to speak. It's a beautiful thing. And it's not like, probably doesn't just, I mean, you get sometimes you get this idea that, boy, if I'm filled with the Spirit, I'll levitate above the ground nine feet and just skate through everything while everyone else is struggling. I'm flying high. Yeah, keep dreaming. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's just an ordinary life. And the Spirit sets us free. Speak your mind, speak your heart, and you glorify God. You get out of the way. Stop thinking about you. And I want to share a scripture that I also ran into my 20s that was really helpful. Listen to this. Luke's Gospel again. Surprise, right? Listen to this. Luke eleven thirteen. If you then, who are evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? That still gets my attention. I'm like, really? Uh, it sounds like the Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. It sounds right. Does it sound like that to you? Hello? Yeah, let me read it again. If you then, talking about you parents, if your child comes to you and asks for a, a toy, you're not going to give him a scorpion, right? You're not going to give him something that's going to hurt him. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? I started to get a hold of that one. I'm like, well, if that verse said... Uh, there's a big pile of money, and the father, which it doesn't say that, but he's willing to give it to those who ask. I'd be like, sign me up now. I'll take a boatload of that stuff, but it's something even more valuable than money or fame. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Now, another brief lightning rod, or lightning um, Round. What is this speech? Let's break it down a little bit more. Like, what is this speech? What does it look like? Number one is the Holy Spirit will empower you to speak truth with no personal preference. So, what do you mean by that? Your lousy opinions have nothing to do with it. Get your opinion out of it and just speak the truth. Thanksgiving, praise, edifying speech, you get you out of there. Now you're dialed in on one thing and one thing only. Praise God and saying things that are edifying and uplifting. That's it. If you've ever led a Bible study or you've talked to your children about the Lord or you've done any kind of verbal ministry ever and that should cover most of us you will know if you've done it for any duration of time that it fails when you start putting yourself in there and your opinions and your thoughts and imaginations it actually begins to lose power and integrity because it's just you get your stuff out of there so the holy spirit will empower you to speak truth without any personal preferences because your preferences don't matter. Mine don't matter. Number two, 
the Holy Spirit will empower you to disrupt unholy relational agreements. What is that? Elephants in the room that everyone just agrees to not talk about? That doesn't work. No, there's an elephant in the room. I'm going to yell, there's an elephant right there. That thing is ugly. And why is no one talking about it? You know, like in your family, there are things we just don't talk about. The practical effect of that is, is it oppresses freedom. And it pushes people down. And when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of a person, they start going around. <laughs> Not hateful. They just start pointing out, like, how come the emperor has no clothes on? Everyone's saying he's got a great outfit on, but the guy's not wearing any clothes. The Holy Spirit empowers people to like, does that make people uncomfortable? Yeah, if you're pretending that reality isn't reality, yeah, the gig is up. That's what Peter and John were doing. They're like, hey, listen, just to clarify you guys, there are man who's now not crippled and you're wanting to come after us but it was through Jesus that the guy was healed so got a problem you're looking at the messengers here that's one of the practical effects and this can cause listen this can get you in trouble but you know what I'd rather be free than to start tiptoeing around something that everyone's just agreeing to kind of ignore so the Holy Spirit will empower you to disrupt unholy relational agreements. And as a corollary to that, He will also empower you to accept the consequences, whatever they might be. Pick your battles, right? Am I free or, not, or am I in bondage? I'd rather be in a prison cell and be free than be living in a nice house with all that I need and be a captive. There is such a thing. There is such a thing as having all the material goods and being completely tied up and in the grip of the flesh and the enemy. Number four, the Holy Spirit will empower you through your speech to give glory to God. This is what can be so offensive about speech that is Holy Spirit inspired. Is that inevitably... The lady who's doing the talking, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, is going to be directing conversation to God and to His Son, Jesus Christ, and pointing people to that. And some people don't want to be pointed in that direction. They shut their ears. But that's the whole point, is that the Holy Spirit empowered... The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to be a pointer towards Jesus. And so not surprisingly... When you're filled with the Spirit and you begin to talk, you're giving glory to God. Lifting up His name. Pointing out how He is the one who's been good to you and been good to us. Strangely enough, some, I've been in churches all my life, but sometimes in churches it, uh, it's almost the last thing you hear in informal conversation. But you give glory to God. He's the centerpiece. And so, remember how we said, get your personal preferences out of there? That is a, 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 a block to giving glory to God is when we get our own stuff in there. Get your own stuff out of there. Give glory to God. So the conversation is always directed towards Jesus. Now, I know it can be uh, in some settings, you know, you get someone who's being unnatural and there's a conversation in a certain subject that's being discussed and they, well, let me, let me back up. I've been in general counsel more than a few times. That's kind of the big collection of the Christian Missionary Alliance. They're all doing business and talking about things. And, and some guy gets up to the microphone and starts talking about the Jewish people. And it's like, yeah, we're discussing something here and you're talking about the Jewish people, which is good, but like totally inappropriate. Completely out of order. There is such a thing. And we're not talking about being out of order and then saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just preaching the word. Uh, there's a way to do it that is proper and that gives glory to God. And that's what we're talking about. Now, the last thing that I want to note real quick 
is that as the Holy Spirit is filling you, live free. Live free. One of the biggest blocks is you. What do you mean? Thinking about me and then trying to get my preferences um, in, uh, trying to get everyone to work around me, get you out of the way, and you're actually now free. Free to speak, free to be, and not be under the tyranny of the flesh and of, of bondage. Now, I said at the beginning, there, uh, there's really one main thing I want to drill home, and that is to be filled with the Spirit results in God-honoring, God-glorifying speech. That's a primary thing I want to drill home. And I mentioned that I wanted to kind of do a little bit of a, a dive into what that speech actually looks like. We just did that. And then I mentioned that I want to give you an opportunity to respond. And I'd like to read that verse again from Luke eleven thirteen. If you then... Who are evil know how to get good know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him you have permission to ask the Father for more of the Holy Spirit and you're completely free to do so and you won't get in trouble no one's gonna think you're weird uh, Patty could you come and play now as Patty's going to come play and I want to I'm going to put something in front of you maybe a bit of a challenge I know it's always nice and I, I, I now spend time sitting in the pews it's nice just to sit I'll just I'll, I'll pray and I'll do my thing here but I want to if I want to challenge you that if you want to come and ask the father for more of the Holy Spirit I want to challenge you you can actually come up front you can kneel down or you can sit in the front row and do business with God. Could you, um, could you go ahead and play a song? Um, and I'm, we're opening up right now. You're free to come. You're free to come. Come to the front, maybe kneel down, sit on the front row and do business with God and say to him, you said in your word that you will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Well, that would be me right now. And I'm asking for the Holy Spirit. Now, you may be sitting there saying, I don't want to move. That's fine, too. Um, he, can, he can give you what you need sitting where you're at as well. Everyone's free in this moment, free to talk to the Lord, free to sit wherever you're at. There's no compulsion here, but you are free to ask for more of the Holy Spirit if you would wish. that scripture one more time then I'm going to pray over all of you but the scripture is from Luke chapter 11 verse 13 if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him 
Let me just pray over everyone that's here and pray over the entire congregation and everyone that's out in the lobby as well. Father, your people yearn to be free. We yearn to be free. And your son said that he came to set captives free. Whom the son sets free will be free indeed. And so we pray for a greater administration of the Holy Spirit. We confess ignorance. We don't know what that may mean in its entirety, but we ask for the Holy Spirit. We believe that to be a good thing. And we're taking you at your word, what your son said, that you will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. We're asking. We're asking for more of the Holy Spirit. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. One of the things, sometimes at the fellowship where my family's at right now is that they'll have an altar call. And sometimes I'll go forward, and I don't even know why I'm going. I'm just saying yes. I, I told a guy I was praying with once. You know, when you're at the front, or when you're, you're helping, you're ministering to people, when people respond, you're all, you, you, you often should a, you need to ask them, what are you responding to? What brings you forward? What is it that you would like? It brings clarity to the issue. And oftentimes I'm like, well, I don't really know. God is good, and I want more of him, and that's about all I got. Um, and I want to encourage you. Um, one of the best things you can do is call the Lord to account. Say, you said in your word, X. And I'm taking you up on that. I'm taking you up on that. All right, we will transition now to a time of communion. And since we've been in Luke and Acts, I want to stay in, in Luke's gospel and just read a portion from that gospel on communion. Um, often called the Lord's Supper. This is always an intimate time. Uh, communion is open to um, everyone who's a Christian. If you're a Christian, then the table is set for you. But our Lord here, this is in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, is in a moment of intimacy is sitting, reclining with the apostles. And often we'll say that the only reason we continue to do communion is because Jesus said to do it. If he hadn't said to do it, we wouldn't do it. Um, but I want to just read the passage from Luke chapter 22. And when the hour came, this is starting in verse 14, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So that's the scripture. Um, we'll invite the elders to come forward and we'll distribute the elements. As you get the elements, just hang on to them. We will take them together. And I also invite you to take advantage of this time to continue meditating on the things of God and anything that he's bringing to your attention and just...
talk to him about that. And there will be people praying for some of you as well, so uh, just a heads up on that. Okay. All right, so each of you should have your, your kit. Um, so first we will take the wafer, which comes out of the bottom. And Jesus, as he had them all gathered together, he said, this is my body. He wasn't talking literally. He's talking figuratively because he was in his body as he was saying, this is my body. 
I said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's do this in remembrance of him as well. Let me pray for us, and then we'll have a closing song. Father, we pray that you'd cement yourself and your spirit in our hearts and lives and Lord receive from us a prayer of thanksgiving being able to participate in the Lord's Supper and be able to do the things that you've commanded us to do we pray that you'd filled each person in this room with a greater uh, sense of your presence and a greater portion of your Holy Spirit and we pray that where there are limitations you would remove those limitations so that we have more capacity for you. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.